Hello everyone, welcome to the lecture on uncertainty modeling in AI. And today we are going to look at the Monte Carlo inference algorithm, or otherwise simply known as the sampling algorithm. So in particular, we are going to look at how to draw samples from a very complicated probability distribution. For example, suppose that I'm given a probability distribution of Px, uh, where x here could be a, a continuous random variable. So what we are looking at here would be uh, in the x-axis is actually the random variable x and in the y-axis uh, this would be the marginal or the uh, probability distribution that we are interested in modeling and what happens here is that this particular uh, probability distribution could be a very complicated one this means that it's very complicated to actually model this probability distribution of px in the exact form and what we will do here is that instead of uh, attempting to model it in the exact form we'll draw samples under this particular uh, distribution where we will have more samples of x that corresponds to the region with a higher probability distribution and lesser sample or sparser samples of x that corresponds to the regions of the lower probability and of course this particular sampling algorithm can also be used in the case where x is a discrete random variable so in that particular case uh, we have seen that this can be modeled by the categorical uh, distribution px it could look something like this but suppose that this particular uh, distribution is a very complicated one and we do not wish to uh, model this in an exact form hence uh, what we can do in the sampling algorithm would be to simply draw samples of x from this complicated uh, distribution where we will then represent the complicated distribution of px using the samples that we have drawn under it now of course i didn't invent any of the materials uh, of today's lecture a lot of the slides and content of this lecture are adopted from especially the first reference material over here an introduction to mcmc for machine learning where mcmc here simply stands for the markov chain monte carlo we'll see this in more detail in today's lecture and uh, i Hope every one of you will uh, take a look at this particular uh, reference material. It's actually a paper written by uh, Christoph as well as co-authored by Michael Jordan, which can be accessed uh, via this particular link over here. It is actually a very comprehensive write-out of the MCMC algorithm, and which uh, I'm going to cover in today's lecture. And of course, I also took some of the materials from chapter 11 from the textbook written by Christopher Bishop, as well as the two sets of lecture slides that is prepared by Eric Singh. He's a professor at CMU, where he gave the a very comprehensive uh, lectures on uh, MCMC, which can be accessed via these two links over here. And I also took some of the materials from chapter 23 of the textbook written by Kevin Murphy, as well as chapter 12 of the textbook written by Daphne Coller. I strongly encourage every one of you to take a look at these materials after today's lecture. Hopefully, by the end of today's lecture, you will be able to explain the Monte Carlo principle, as well as its justification for the sampling algorithm. We will also look at how to apply the rejection importance metropolis has sting uh, metropolis as well as the Gibbs sampling algorithm to do maximum probability approximate inference as well as expectation from the samples that we draw from the probability distribution we'll look at how to use the markov chain properties to show the validity of the metropolis hasting algorithm now before i go into the detail of the monte carlo sampling algorithm let me just give a brief history of the algorithm and what's interesting here is that the metropolis algorithm it was selected as one of the top 10 algorithms that had the greatest influence on science and engineering in the 20th century and if you're interested please refer to this particular publication over here so the first version of the monte carlo sampling algorithm was invented by a scientist named Stan Ulam, as shown in this photograph over here, in the year 1946, which was not too long ago, when he was playing the game of uh, solitaire while resting at home from an illness. So for those who didn't know what is uh, the game of solitaire, it's actually a game, a card game, which can be played by yourself, 
as shown in this particular uh, uh, diagram over here, will have part of the stack of the 52 cards facing down, uh, placed at the side over here. And we'll have the rest of the cards uh, arranged in the form of a column as shown in this uh, diagram, where the last card in each column would be facing up and all the rest of the cards uh, inside the columns would be facing down. Rule of the game is that uh, you can move any one of the cards and place it on top of the other cards in the other column as long as they have the same shape and color and as well as they are of running consecutive number from uh, in a descending order. This means that uh, if I were to move this two uh, of spade over here, uh, I need to place it on top of uh, three of spade uh, in another column. And once I move this particular card from one column uh, to another column, uh, the last card that is facing down uh, would be flipped to be facing up. And I can continue the game until I form a consecutive uh, order of all the 12 cards for each one of the respective colors and uh, I, I would be considered uh, winning the particular game. So in the case where you can't move any one of the cards shown here in this particular example over here, what you can do here is that you can flip the card open uh, on this particular deck of uh, cards that is placed facing down on the side. And if it happens to be, uh, say for example, you find the club of five over here, you will be able to pull it out and place it over this particular uh, club of six over here. And then uh, this could actually mean that you will be able to find other cards from those cards that are already facing up in the columns and move them over each other. And what's interesting here is that while he was playing this game, while Stan uh, Ulam was playing this particular game of Solitaire, it occurs to him that uh, why not let's try to compute the chances that a particular Solitaire laid out with 52 cards would came out successfully. This means that uh, uh, given all the particular, there are many configurations uh, because the initialization of this particular game is that you are given some of the cards over here and all the order of the cards that is facing down. And not all these orders would end up to be uh, tractable. This means that not all of them would end up to have a solution such that you can uh, move every one of them into the order of uh, consecutive order in the particular order of the respective colors. And uh, so uh, what occurred to Stan Ulam while he was playing this game is that is it possible to actually check the configuration of what is the all the particular configuration of the arrangements of the cards such that uh, he can figure out which are all the configurations that would lead him to the to winning this particular game so he attempted the naive way of uh, doing this which is uh, to exhaustively come up with all the combinations of the card so this would be intractable because uh, what you are talking about is that you are uh, choosing from 52 cards and all these 52 cards has a chance of placing it in terms of all these columns arrangement as well as the deck of cards that's uh, facing down. So this would be in the order of factorial uh, complexity and it's almost impossible to deterministically or exhaustively come up with all the combinatoric uh, calculations to determine whether he will win this particular deal of the solitaire game. So what he decided to do instead would be to, uh, instead of exhaustively listing down all the combinatoric uh, combinations and do a combinatoric optimization over all possible solutions, uh, he decided to lay out several solitaires at random and then observing and counting the number of successful play. So uh, what he's doing here is actually he's drawing some sort of a sampling uh, of the or the, of the uh, exhaustive uh, list of uh, solution space and by making use of this subset of samples that is drawn from the exhaustive list of combinations uh, he approximates a, a solution he uh, tried to approximate the statistics of the solution 
that would lead him to the particular win of that uh, game. And uh, this idea of selecting a stat statistical sample to approximate hard combinatorics problem by a simpler uh, problem is the heart of what we uh, call Monte Carlo simulation in today's uh, physics and statistics uh, literature as well as in the computer science literature. And here's some pioneers of the Monte Carlo sampling algorithm. So when Stan Ulam first uh, noted this particular uh, way of computing it, he told the problem to uh, John von Neumann and uh, then they've co-authored together the first uh, paper on Monte Carlo sampling. And later on, uh, th this particular paper caught the attention of other scientists uh, who are also interested in this uh, uh, sampling algorithm, such as uh, Nicholas Metropolis, where the Metropolis Hesting algorithm is actually named after him, and as well as uh, Marshall Rosenbluth, Edward Teller, and uh, Augusta Teller. By the way, uh, Edward Teller and Augusta Teller, they are husband and wife, and they actually had a paper which is uh, known as the Teller and Teller paper uh, on uh, sam the sampling algorithm, which is a famous paper uh, on the Monte Carlo sampling algorithm. And uh, all these people contributed greatly to the, uh, to the development of the Monte Carlo sampling algorithm. Uh, by the way, some of you might be wondering why are all these pictures taken in this way. So these pictures are actually uh, taken uh, from the badges of the, these scientists who were actually working on the Manhattan Project to develop the atomic bomb at that time. So the question is that, uh, why do we need sampling? And what I have mentioned earlier in the introductory, uh, in the very first slides as an introduction, is that what we are after is uh, we are after a very complicated uh, distribution that can look something like this. And what we want to do here is that instead of modeling this particular complicated uh, distribution, we are going to uh, draw samples that is under this particular complicated distribution and use these samples to represent the uh, distribution. And of course, by using the samples to represent the distribution, we can also use it to compute uh, all the inferences such as expectation, maximum probability, as well as the, uh, the approximate inference that we are uh, interested in or for the marginal uh, or conditional probability that we have seen in the earlier uh, lecture. So here's a more formalized reason of why do we need uh, sampling. Uh, we know that in Bayesian inference and uh, learning, suppose that we are given some unknown set of uh, random variables, which we denote as x over here, and the data, uh, which is the observed set of uh, random variables denoted by y. The following typical uh, intractable problems are central to the Bayesian statistics. And uh, the first one would be the normalization. Suppose that we are interested in finding uh, the posterior probability of x conditioned upon all the observed random variables of y. We know that in order to compute this, we need to use the Bayes rule, uh, which is uh, given by this particular equation over here. So this is our posterior uh, distribution, and this is our likelihood distribution, where we flip the two random variables around, and this is our prior distribution. And what's interesting here is that uh, it's in order to make this a uh, uh, valid probability distribution, we need to divide the whole thing uh, by a normalizer, uh, which is computed by marginalizing the product of the likelihoods as, uh, as well as the prior. So this would be the marginal uh, probability equivalent to the marginal probability of all our observations of uh, PY over here. And this would always involve some form of marginalization. Uh, in the case where x over here uh, denotes a continuous random variable, we will need to do an integration over all the random variables of x. x is a continuous random variable. We know that this is going to be a summation over all the x. And in the case of uh, where x here is in the large dimensional space, this means that this is a x here 
uh, it's actually consisting of a lot of random variables. This means that this marginalization uh, in the, to, to get the marginal probability of y over here would be uh, what we call intractable to compute in uh, a large dimensional space. So this is what I meant by the case where we cannot compute the, this particular prob posterior probability distribution over here. So in, in referring back to the example that I have gave in the very uh, first few slides. Uh, now here, Px, the example that I gave was uh, Px, but uh, in this particular case here, Px could be actually representing the uh, posterior probability of Px condition upon y. This means that I have this very complicated distribution, which cannot be computed, uh, computed exactly in an exact form because of this integration uh, uh, formulation over here or the summation formulation over here in order to do the marginalization. So one way of doing this is that instead of doing this in the exact form, I'm not going to represent this posterior with this particular equation over here. I'm going to simply uh, draw samples from this particular uh, posterior equation and then I'm going to represent this posterior distribution using the samples that I have drawn under this particular distribution where more samples will be drawn corresponding to the regions of high probability and sparser set of samples will be drawn corresponding to the regions of lower uh, probability. So here's a very good example of what we call the approximate inference. This means that I'm approximating uh, this particular posterior distribution here with a set of uh, samples that's drawn under the distribution versus the exact inference algorithm where we compute the exact form of the formulation for this particular posterior distribution over here. So another reason why we need to do sampling is in the case of uh, marginalization. Now suppose that we are given the joint probability uh, distribution of the set of random variables of uh, x and z. Uh, we are often interested in computing the marginal posterior uh, distribution or the marginal uh, probability distribution of uh, x. Uh, in this case here, I also have a, a set of uh, observed random variables which I denote as uh, y over here. So this uh, x over here would be my query set of nodes. And we know from the previous lecture that in order to compute this particular posterior distribution, we need to do marginalization over the set of uh, Nielsen uh, random variables, which we denote as z over here. So in order to do this, uh, it involves uh, either integration over all the set of uh, Nielsen random variable, in the case where z here is a continuous random variable and uh, it would be a summation over z if it is in the case where z here is a discrete set of random variable and this particular integration or marginalization step could be very tedious in the case where the Nielsen random variable z is a very high dimensional random variable or it could be that it takes a, uh, it's a, actually a very large set of uh, random variables. So instead of uh, modeling this particular or computing this particular posterior distribution here, by uh, following through all the steps of the marginalization over the random variable z over here, uh, we will simply draw the samples uh, from this particular posterior distribution to represent it. So here, uh, referring back to the graphical example, the uh, example that I have drawn using the graph uh, uh, earlier on, where instead of uh, representing the y-axis as px, now we are saying that this uh, y-axis would be our posterior, the marginal posterior distribution that we are interested in, which is the probability of x condition upon y, uh, and uh, here the x-axis here would be uh, the random variables of x and what we are interested in is that uh, we are interested in modeling this particular marginal probability which can be very complicated to compute in the exact form due to this integration and summation operations so instead of doing this uh, summation or uh, integration operations over a large a dimensional space Nielsen random variables. We are going to draw samples from this particular uh, distribution, the particular posterior uh, distribution, marginal posterior distribution that we are interested in.
and where a lot of samples uh, are going to be drawn from the regions uh, corresponding to the regions of high probability and sparser set of uh, samples are going to be drawn from the uh, regions of lower probability. So as a result, we are going to make use of these samples that is drawn from this distribution to represent it. The third reason why we need sampling would be to compute uh, expectation where the objective of the analysis is often to obtain summary statistics in the form of uh, uh, integration or the marginalization over uh, this random variable of x over here. Now suppose that we are going to compute the expectation of the function of fx over the posterior uh, distribution of px condition upon uh, y and this would be equal to the integration of uh, over all the random variables of x and fx multiplied by the probability uh, over dx. So in the case here where x is a discrete random variable instead of a continuous random variable, this integral sign would become a summation uh, would become a summation sign over here over x. And uh, if in the case again in the case where the random variable x where we are going to marginalize over lives in a very high dimensional space or it could be that this is this consists of a large amount of uh, number of uh, random variables that we need to marginalize over and the operation is usually uh, ends up to be intractable or it's not computable within a certain limited uh, resources memory resources or computational power of our computer uh, we will then uh, represent this particular expectation uh, step using the samples that is drawn from the distribution of uh, p uh, of x condition upon y so in this case here we'll see that this expectation or this uh, integral sign over here or the summation sign over here would correspond to the sample that is drawn from the this particular conditional probability distribution uh, or posterior distribution that we're interested in over x. Suppose that this distribution is very complicated and now after drawing the samples uh, which we have described earlier that we have more samples corresponding to the regions of higher probability and less samples corresponding to the region of lower uh, probability and then we'll use these particular samples to represent the this posterior distribution itself and the next thing that we will do in the to compute the expectation as we'll see in the next few slides is that this is approximately equals to the n number of samples 1 divided by the n number of samples and the sum of all the uh, samples because each one of these samples simply means that it's going to take a certain state at the uh, for the random variable of x and we are going to evaluate all these samples uh, all this number of uh, samples which we index as L uh, over uh, the function that we are interested in computing the expectation. Now that's another reason of why we need to do sampling which is in the case of the doing optimization. Now suppose that we have some objective functions uh, that we want to optimize over the feasible solutions. Uh, an example would be what we have seen earlier in the case of playing the uh, solitaire. Uh, this could be a set of solution which is continuous and unbounded. Uh, in the case of the solitaire, it's actually discrete and unbounded. And uh, in general, it will be too computationally expensive to compare all the solutions to find out which one is the optimal. So the best way to do this would be actually to draw the samples from out of the uh, cost function and then uh, just pick the one that maximizes the uh, cost function coming closer to what we are doing would be in terms of uh, finding the maximal probability. So the maximal probability that we are interested in, suppose that we are looking at this particular equation over here, we are going to do a uh, argmax over the random uh, variable of x and px which is actually our cost function over here. So this is actually an optimization uh, problem that we are interested in solving and uh, another part of this particular problem would be simply to find the max over px. This means that I want to optimize p. I want to find the maximum probability over here uh, over the random variable x and this in this case here, px would also be our cost function. So this px here 
it could be a very complicated uh, distribution that we have no way to evaluate it in the exact form. So what we will do here is that we'll simply uh, draw samples from this particular uh, target distribution of the uh, probability x, uh, p of x over here. And in this case, we'll draw uh, samples as we have mentioned many times in the earlier uh, slides that there will be more samples corresponding to the region of higher probability and less sample corresponding to the uh, region of lower probability. And after we have done with this uh, sampling of this particular uh, this probability distribution that we are interested in modeling, we will then evaluate each one of these samples uh, over the uh, for, for the probability of this uh, each one of these samples and we'll check for the sample that corresponds to the maximum probability the maximum probability and that would be the state or that particular the state of the that particular sample that corresponds to the maximum probability would be taken as the uh, x that achieves the arc max over this particular probability distribution as well as this particular value over here that corresponds to the maximum probability of the samples that is drawn uh, would be corresponding to the maximum probability uh, that is the solution of this particular cost function here that we are interested in computing. Now let's look at the uh, Monte Carlo principle which is the underlying principle that explains to us why uh, the sampling algorithm can work. Now suppose that we draw a IID set of samples uh, denoted by xi uh, 1 to n from a target uh, density distribution which we denote as a px over here. So we always use the target distribution or the target density uh, uh, px uh, here to denote the probability density function or the probability distribution that we are interested in drawing a sample and this particular uh, target density function over here or target distribution over here it could be very complicated so complicated what I meant here is that it is intractable to compute this in the exact form that means that it could consist of uh, some integral uh, function or some uh, summation function that we need to uh, perform over the joint probability distribution which can be a uh, very computationally inefficient to do in a high dimensional space of x and suppose that we are able to draw uh, n number of IID samples from this. An example the, uh, here would be the possible configurations of a system, the set of, uh, on which the posterior is defined, or the combinatoric uh, set of the feasible solution as what we have mentioned earlier. So we said that this n samples can be used to approximate the target density function with the following empirical point mass function. So the point mass function is actually the probability uh, to compute the probability of uh, of uh, x taking a certain state. So here, uh, an illustration here would be uh, what I have mentioned earlier that this p x over here it's actually a complicated distribution. But instead of uh, modeling this particular complicated uh, distribution of p x in an exact form, uh, which can be intractable to compute. What we will do here is that we will draw samples of uh, n number of samples under this particular distribution. And then we will represent this posterior distribution with the n number of samples in the form of the delta direct mass function located at every sample. So suppose that this is my sample i. What I will do here is that I will compute the delta of uh, xi over here, which is uh, this particular guy over here. It's a point mass uh, sample of this uh, of this particular state uh, and the probability that is uh, uh, computed from that can be computed from the probability distribution of p of x over here and uh, we'll suppose that I'm going to find out what is the probability of uh, p uh, is equals to uh, where x is equals to uh, x capital X for example and let's say this is my sample of uh, capital X I, I will take all the samples that are lesser than capital X over here, all the samples that I have drawn from the distribution, and simply evaluate the 
probability value and take the average of it to be the probability distribution or the to be the probability value of x taking the state of capital x under this particular uh, posterior uh, distribution which can be very difficult to model in order to derive the correctness of this uh, sampling algorithm or the monte carlo sampling algorithm we'll first look at the weak versus the strong law of large number so we know that the weak law of uh, large number uh, is stated as such that the sample average uh, denoted by bar x over here where this bar x is computed from the uh, average of x1 plus x2 all the way to xn divided by n number of samples so this is the uh, just the expected uh, mean of the from the sample uh, that we have uh, drawn from the distribution it converges in uh, probability towards uh, expected value of uh, mu over here so in this case here we'll use mu to represent the population mean or the expected uh, mean so in this case uh, I will denote this as my expected value or the population mean and bar x over here would be my sample mean so the difference between this is that the population mean means that uh, it's the the mean of my true distribution of my true distribution which I wish to model which is this guy this curve over here the mean true mean of this un under this particular probability distribution over here and since I cannot evaluate this exactly I'll draw samples under this uh, distribution and then I'll compute the expected mean of my sample size or the uh, sample mean which is denoted by bar x as a average of over all the n number of samples that I have drawn under this particular distribution we in the weak law of large number we say that the sample mean or the av sample average converges or tend towards the expected value or the population mean when the number of samples that is being drawn in the in our operation over here uh, tends to infinity and uh, this means that uh, if I, do I draw all the samples that's enough to cover uh, the whole uh, sample size or, or the whole search space or the whole state space of the my random variable then uh, the sample mean would converge towards the population mean which is uh, intuitively uh, true that because after you have a sample a uh, very very large number of uh, samples this means that you will be sufficient to cover the whole space and this means that your expected value of the samples would be exactly the same or would tend towards the uh, expected mean of the population and that is uh, in, in other words for any positive number of uh, epsilon over here I say that the probability of the difference the absolute difference between the expected uh, sample mean and the expected population mean would be more than uh, this epsilon this means that there is a probability that uh, this the difference here uh, occurring uh, would be equals to zero what, what this means is that uh, since I'm saying that the limit of n tends to infinity the probability of this occurring is equals to zero this means uh, the difference of this uh, sample mean and as well as the population mean to be more than a certain threshold is going to be quite unlikely hence the two means over here the sample mean as well as the population mean they are going to be very close to each other when the number of sample size tends to infinity and here as I've mentioned earlier on that the bar x over here the sample mean would be computed as the average of all the samples that is drawn and mu over here would be the true uh, population mean given by the integration of x uh, uh, over the exact probability distribution of px now there is also a strong law of large number where we say that the sample average of bar x converges almost surely to the expected value of mu so when the number of samples tends towards uh, infinity so what this means is that uh, it can be written in this way that the probability that x the sample uh, mean uh, x bar over here 
would be equal to the population mean of mu would be equals to one and this means that uh, the, as the number of samples approaches infinity uh, i'm almost for sure that the sample mean would become equal to the expected uh, population mean let's contrast this to the weak law where uh, we are saying that the probability of the difference being more than a certain threshold here note that there's a certain threshold over here is equals to zero uh, this means that uh, there is still a gap there's still a, a room for a marginal gap between the sample mean as well as the uh, population mean even when the number of samples tend towards infinity but in the case of the strong law of large number when the number of samples tend towards infinity i'm almost for sure that uh, the sample mean would be equivalent or would be equal to my population mean without fail and as a consequence of the strong law of large number what this means is that we can then approximate the integrals of any function of f with a tractable sum of over the samples that is drawn under the distribution for the function of f shown in this particular equation over here so what we can see here is equivalent to our sample mean where x over here is all the samples that we have drawn from the probability distribution of our px this probability distribution uh, could be a very complicated distribution that we cannot uh, model in the exact form so we'll draw some samples from it we'll draw n number of samples and then we'll put it through a function of f over here and uh, we can see that this particular equation here is similar to uh, bar x which we have seen uh, earlier which is given by 1 over n and the summation over all the n number of samples of uh, x i uh, so we'll extrapolate this particular thought uh, into the function will evaluate this x over a function and uh, we will say that the final result over this uh, function of f would be equivalent to uh, 1 over n the uh, and the summation over all the results of the x over on every of the samples that is drawn from this probability distribution which is similar to this equation over here to compute the sample mean and we've seen that earlier that this uh, in this case here the sample mean we saw that uh, as the number of samples converges or, or tend towards infinity where n over here tends towards infinity this particular sample mean over here it will converge asymptotically into the population mean which is given by mu over here and mu would be equivalent to the integral of a uh, the probability distribution of px uh, dx uh, which is what we have seen in the previous lectures here we will extrapolate this into the uh, function of f where we can see that as the number of samples tend towards infinity this particular summation over here would converge asymptotically into the integral of the probability distribution multiplied by the function of fx so as a result we say that uh, we can approximate this particular integral sign over here the integration operation over here with the summation of all the samples that is drawn from the probability uh, distribution where in the case here the integration over x where x here is actually a very uh, large or high dimensional space uh, this means that this integral sign here could be intractable and in this case here using the, the strong law of the large number we say that we can approximate this intractable integral sign or intractable summation sign over a very high dimensional space of uh, the random variable of x with the tractable sign over all the samples that we draw from the probability distribution and in the case where the variance of the function fx satisfy this equation over here which is sigma f square let us denote sigma f square as the variance of the function of fx uh, to be equal to the expectation over uh, fx square minus i square of x uh, 
to be less than infinity. What this means is that uh, this particular variance here is within a certain bound. Then the variance of the estimator i of nf is equivalent to this uh, function over here, which is given by sigma f squared divided by n. We also say that this particular sigma f squared is our population variance. This particular variance over here, which is given by sigma f squared divided by n, uh, it's our sample variance. So we can see that there is a difference between the sample variance and the population variance by the division over the number of samples. And here's the proof that the population variance is given by sigma f squared divided by n. Uh, we will start off by writing the variance of x. Uh, that would be equal to the expectation of x minus the expectation of uh, x and uh, the holding square. And we can evaluate it into this particular expression over here. What this means is that uh, uh, this implies that the variance over the function of x uh, could be simply given by uh, this term over here, which we can then evaluate in the subtraction of these two terms over here. And finally, we equate this term over here to be equal to sigma f squared, which is what we have defined to be the variance of the uh, function f. And this would be our population variance. And now let's further evaluate the term that uh, represents the, our sample variance over here. So this is our sample variance, which is denoted by the variance of bar x. And this would be equal to the variance of 1 over n uh, summation over all the samples that we have drawn from the probability distribution. This guy over here is simply uh, bar x, which is what we have defined uh, in the earlier slides, where we can pull this 1 over n out uh, from the uh, variance operation. And this would be equivalent to 1 over n squared uh, because of this uh, square term in the definition of the variance. And uh, we can also pull the summation sign out of the variance uh, since this uh, follow the uh, principle of linearity. And uh, now we'll end up with this uh, expression over here of 1 over n square summation of over all the variance of each one of the samples. And we can see that if we denote the variance of xn to be uh, sigma square over here, we'll get the summation over n number of times over sigma square. Uh, this term over here, the summation over sigma square, will essentially give us n sigma square, uh, where we can cancel off one of the n's in the denominator over here. And finally, we will end up with uh, the uh, this expression of sigma square over n, which denotes the sample uh, variance over here. And uh, we can do the same trick as before. That is, we denote uh, x bar here with our function of uh, f over here, where x is actually uh, equivalent to the function f, we'll get the variance of the, the estimator that we have, the integration estimator that we have, uh, and this would be equivalent to 1 over n summation of over f of n, since x is equals to f over here, where we'll simply do the same trick by pulling out the, the n in, in, inside this particular operation here to become n squared, and then uh, this term over here will evaluate to become n multiplied by uh, sigma f squared, where variance of fn is simply the sigma of uh, f. And we can see that uh, this evaluates, since the n cancels off, we, it will evaluate to uh, become sigma f squared divided by n, which is our sample variance. Now putting the derivations that we have seen earlier on for the mean as well as the variance of the uh, estimator of i n over the function of f, we will come to the central limit theorem that yields convergence in the distribution of the error. What it means here is that uh, the difference between the uh, estimator over uh, f and the true f over here, the true integration over the function of f over here, uh, it would follow a normal distribution as the number of samples that is drawn uh, to represent this, to approximate the function f uh, goes to infinity. And this particular distribution, normal distribution here, is 
characterized or parameterized by a zero variance where which follows the uh, law of strong numbers as we have seen earlier here that is uh, in this particular case here we saw that uh, as the number of the, the the samples tend towards infinity this two becomes equivalent that means that i n becomes equivalent to i and what this means is that the difference between them would be simply uh, zero between the average values of these two uh, would be simply zero and uh, that means that in this case here uh, the mean of the difference between i n and i would be zero and we have further seen that the variance of this uh, estimator is given by the population variance uh, so denoted by sigma f square divided by n and if we were to pull this n out of the normal distribution, this is why we get the uh, square root of n over here in this particular term over here. Hence, what this means is that we can approximate the uh, integration over the function of f under a probability distribution of p of x with our estimator of i n uh, over here, where there is a error distribution uh, that is given by uh, the normal distribution over here that characterized by or parameterized by zero mean and uh, sigma f of uh, square now as i have mentioned earlier that the n samples can also be used to uh, obtain a maxima objective of the px as follows where we can uh, directly draw samples under the probability distribution. This can be a very complicated distribution over here, where we'll draw all the samples under this probability distribution. And here we'll evaluate every one of these samples that is uh, drawn under this distribution on what is the probability value. And we'll pick the one with the highest probability value to be the uh, x that gives us the argmax over this probability distribution. So as a result of what, as what we have seen so far uh, would be what we call the non-parametric representation. This is in contrast with what we have seen in the earlier part of the lecture, where we always parameterize the representation of a probability distribution. For example, using the mean and covariance of a Gaussian distribution, of a Gaussian distribution that is uh, written as this way over here. So Px would be given by the normal distribution of uh, the mean and uh, condition upon the mean which is represented by mu as well as a covariance of sigma square and this would be uh, used to as a parametric representation of the uh, probability distribution and in the case where uh, we, which we have looked at so far in this particular lecture we are looking at the representation uh, in a non-parametric way this means that instead of uh, representing it in a closed form equations that looks like this we are going to represent the probability distribution with a set of samples that is drawn under uh, the normal distribution which we then use to represent this particular uh, probability distribution the advantage of the non-parametric distribution is that there's no restriction on the type of distribution. It can be multimodal, non-Gaussian, etc. So uh, this means that however complicated this particular distribution is, there's always representation or samples, a set of samples that we can draw from this distribution to represent it. Now here's an example uh, of the uh, distribution so of fx where we can see that uh, we have more samples under the regions of higher probability and a sparser set of samples under the region with lower probability. Here's another example, uh, which is a multimodal distribution. And uh, this particular probability distribution is actually uh, much more complicated in, as compared to the Gaussian distribution shown in the first example. So now, uh, having looked at and, or having motivated the reasons of uh, why we need non-parametric or sampling to represent the posterior distribution, the million dollar question is that how do we draw samples from the function or a given uh, distribution?